of welcoming our dear friend. You should know him by now. Uh, uh, Eli, I made a mistake. You know, he's almost a doctor, but I think he's still uh, working on his doctorate. Uh, he's so busy with the with it, it, there's a little mini bio there. He's, he's busy with the with the ABTS Arab Baptist Theological Seminary in Lebanon, but I believe he, he should be able to get it done. He said that he's, he's, on, he's, on, he's on the path, he's almost finished his, his, his PhD, but also, as you know, uh, he's a president of ABTS, and they're going, they don't do just theological training, they're involved with so much outreach in Lebanon, especially to the, the Syrian refugees, and, and we're very privileged to have him here. He's, he's kind of swinging through North America. I think he does it about once a year, and there's a lot of churches he can go to, but, uh, and, and he's kind of, I think he's, he's supposed to on your break, right? He's supposed, to, he's supposed to be taking a little break, but he's actually said he's willing, he was willing to come and on the, on the way back uh, uh, he, he, he's swinging through Toronto and I, I grabbed him for, for our church. Uh, his, his wife who's normally with, us, with him uh, comes to visit us is at the Baptist Women's uh, 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 Retreat or Seminar in, in Quebec or Ottawa? Ottawa. So, so Mireille's there. Please remember Mireille. But, uh, but thank you again uh, Ellie for coming and please join me in welcoming Ellie Haddad. Thank you so much, Pastor Ted. <clears throat> and I promise that I'll finish that PhD soon. Yeah. It's great to be here again. Um, uh, it's great to be here uh, during uh, the theme of uh, evangelism and mission. This is a theme that's very close to my heart. And this is a theme that's very close to God's heart. Actually, the theme of my PhD is cultivating missional ecclesiology for the local Baptist church in Lebanon. So a missional church, a sent out church, is something that uh, ve I'm very much passionate about. And this is what uh, Paul talks about in the passage that we heard this morning in 2 Corinthians 3. And right now in Canada, we find ourselves uh, very close in, in terms of context to, uh, to the context that they had in the first uh, century church. Um, right now in Canada, it's very much post-Christendom. Christianity is no longer at the center. Christianity is on the edges. Christianity is at the margin. Uh, and our Canadian context is becoming a very difficult missional field, uh, like it was in the first century. The first uh, Christians, they knew that their message was new, and their message was transformative, and their message was revolutionary, and their message was, was threatening. And Jesus and also his disciples uh, had prepared them from the beginning for life of hardship and life of persecution. But that did not deter them. That did not drive them away. That did not scare them. They knew that they were called to be witnesses and to make disciples of all the nations, no matter how difficult that turned out to be. And the New Testament scriptures that we have in front of us were written to equip them for that task, for that purpose. This is what Paul is doing in the passage that we read this morning, guiding the congregation in Corinth on what it means to be ambassadors of Christ in their world. As, as Paul is talking about his own role in uh, apostolic vocation, it becomes clear that this is really a shared calling, not just for Paul, but for the Corinthians as well. He wants the Corinthians to share in his work and to continue his work in his absence. They have been called to Christ and experienced the wonders of the gospel so that they can now be ambassadors of Christ to Corinth as Paul was to them. These Corinthian Christians needed to understand that they had been drawn to Christ so that Corinth, through them, could see and smell the good news of God's healing love. They were not to hide their light under a bushel. Uh, rather, they were to live their lives before the watching Corinthians as a witness. That is an evidence of the goodness and invitation of the gospel. So the Corinthians, they knew what Paul was talking about because they were themselves the result of his work. The very fact of their existence as believing, witnessing church validates Paul's ministry. He reminds them that the gospel has transformed them into something new, made them into a letter to be read by everyone in Corinth. So God's spirit has written the gospel on their hearts so that they can be known and read by all. And God's spirit has written this gospel on our hearts so that we can be known and read by all. Through us, the world into which we are sent is going to experience the good news of God's transforming love. Here is a way of talking about our calling that has very great relevance for our task as the church today in what has become a difficult and challenging mission field. So the mission field is not just overseas. The mission field is not just when we get into a plane and go somewhere else. The mission field is right here where we live, where we work, where we minister, where we go to school. 
So it's very important that we understand what it means to be a sent out church, a church that sees every member as a minister, every member as a missionary to their own context, to their own, to their own sphere of influence. A question for you. Where do a majority of men and women spend the majority of their time interacting with the majority of the lost world? <clears throat> I'll, I'll uh, frame it again. Where do a majority of men and women spend the majority of their time interacting with the majority of the lost world? It's not our pastors, it's not our uh, staff at church, it's each one of us in their workplace, in the marketplace. We are the people that are in the world meeting people that need to understand the gospel and need to understand God's love and God's salvation. So it's, it's, uh, it'll be important to develop very quickly a theology of work. Sometimes we tend to think that we go to work in order to get an income, uh, in order to pay the bills, in, in order to make ends meet. And then we leave work and then we think about ministry. How can we minister? How can we spend the rest of our time in ministry? We don't t tend to think about our work, our vocation as a ministry. So I want us to look a little bit about uh, a biblical understanding of work, biblical understanding of vocation. First of all, the, the, the term work uh, did not start during the fall. There were implications on work during the fall. But uh, God works, and God has always worked. Uh, Genesis 2 talks about God, and on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God has created and made. The Bible talks about God as a worker. In Psalm 8, it says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained. You have created and you have ordained. God is working. Not only God works, but God establishes our own work. In Psalm 90, it says, And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. God is establishing our work. And the Proverbs 22 talks about God honoring good work. Do you see a man who excels in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before unknown men. So the, the, the Bible shows us that God cares about our work. It's not a necessary evil. It's something that's very much part of what God does and part of God's design. Even Jesus had to work. John 9, uh, Jesus says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. In John 17 I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. It was important for Jesus to be doing exactly what the Father has sent him to do. And then when Jesus, uh, before he leaves, before he departs, he says, as the Father has sent me, I send you. He's given us the same commission to go and do the will of the Father, to work. Ephesians 4 talks about our help, helping our work, helping others. Let him who steal, steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. And Colossians 3 talks that all our work is ministry unto the Lord. Let every detail in your lives, words, actions, whatever, be done in the name of the Master Jesus, thanking God the Father every step of the way. So there's a lot in the Bible, and I just mentioned a few verses, but the Bible is full of verses that are talking about work. Work is not a necessary evil. Work is ordained by God. God works. Jesus works. We are called to work. So what does it mean then for, for us to be Christians in the workplace or Christians in the marketplace? Dorothy Sayers puts it this way, and I love the way she puts it. Listen to this. The church's approach to an intelligent carpenter is usually confined to exhorting him not to be drunk and disorderly in his leisure hours and to come to church on Sundays. What the church should be telling him is this, that the very first demand that his religion makes upon him is that he should make good tables. Church, by all means, and decent forms of, of amusement, certainly. But what use is all of that if in the very center of his life and occupation he is insulting God with bad carpentry? 
No crooked table legs or ill-fitting drawers ever, I dare swear, came out of the carpenter's shop at Nazareth. No piety in the worker will compensate for work that is not true to itself. So being Christians in the workplace does not just mean that uh, we don't do any evil in the workplace, but there's something much deeper than that, that we are honoring God and we are glorifying God in, uh, in our work. So what, what determines our identity? What determines what we work or where do we serve? Or what's our vocation and how do we serve? Os Guinness, uh, in his book, The Call, it's, uh, it's a very good book if you want to read this, The Call. Uh, he talks about uh, three uh, views of how we see our uh, vocation. The first one is we're constrained to be. We are constrained to be. We are limited by who we are. I was born in Lebanon, so I, I'm limited by the things that I can do because I was Lebanese. I can't become president of the United States. I cannot become an astronaut. There are many things that I cannot become because of who I am, because of where I was created. I was created a man, I cannot become a mother and celebrate Mother's Day today. I'm constrained to be because of who I am, where I was born, the, the surroundings, the, the limitations. The second view is the courage to be. And we hear that a lot, especially these days, that we can be all that we want to be. If we want it, if we work hard, then we can be that thing. The third view is that we're constituted to be. That means that it is written. It's, there's a destiny. There's something written for the future of every single one of us that we cannot run away from. It is written. So the first one is constraint to be, limitations, courage to be, all, be all you, can want, all you want to be, constituted to be, destiny. And maybe there's a little bit of truth in each one of these. But then Os Guinness challenges us that there is a fourth one, a fourth way of looking at our identity. We're called to be. Um, there is a calling. And calling presupposes that there's a caller. The caller is God, and we're called to be something. So this is how Os Guinness defines calling. Calling is the truth that God calls us to himself so decisively that everything we are, everything we do, Everything we have is invested with a special devotion, special dynamism, and special direction lived out as a response to his summons and service. Everything that we are, when we were saved, he saved all of us. He saved our time, he saved our finances, he saved our efforts, he, served, he saved our attitudes, he saved our everything. Everything that we are belongs to him. So God is interested in everything that we do. God is not disinterested. And uh, us calls it here a summons, not just a calling, but a summons. Because usually when the king calls, uh, people obey. They don't discuss it. They don't negotiate. They just obey. It's more of a summons. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, what's preventing us from living our vocation is that we tend to think that the place of ministry is inside the four walls of the church. And the people that do ministry are the ministers in the church. Um, listen to what Martin Luther says. Let everyone, therefore, who knows himself to be a Christian, be assured of this and apply it to himself, that we are all priests and there is no difference between us. Uh, we talk as evangelicals and as Baptists that we believe in the priesthood, priesthood of all believers, that each one of us is a priest. We have a role to play, a priestly role to play in the world, but we don't usually live that. So what's the role of the ministers inside the church? Who, who does the work of ministry? Ephesians 4, uh, Paul answers, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evan evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. These are uh, leadership gifts that uh, God provides in the church to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So God has ordained, has called some, to be leaders within the church so that they prepare, they equip uh, the rest of us to do the work of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. It's the rest of us that are facing and that are meeting non-believers every day in our life, uh, in, in our workplace, uh, in our neighborhood, in the marketplace, every, everywhere we go. So we come to church, we come to church to be equipped, we come to church to be coached, we come to church to worship, we come to church to have fellowship, 
and we go outside to serve. We go outside to where the mission field is. We go outside to do the work of service. Uh, we, we tend to see the work of ministry as the work of the professionals, the paid church staff or the paid ministers or the ordained uh, or commissioned uh, missionaries. But God is calling every single one of us to do something for, uh, for this mission field. So what types of Christians do we have in the workplace? We have Christians that are just simply trying to survive. They just want to go to the, wor the workplace and uh, not to do any evil and come back home and get the paycheck and now we can pay our tithes. Then the second level is living by Christian principles. So it's those Christians that go to the workplace and wanting to live their Christian principles, wanting to be witnesses by the way they behave. Then uh, there's a deeper level of those that live by the power of the Holy Spirit in the workplace. Uh, they go and they, they have that victory with them. They have the Holy Spirit, taking the Holy Spirit to the workplace. And then there's a deeper level, is that the Christians who go to the workplace knowing that they are called to transform their workplace for Christ. There's a transformative power in each one of us with the Holy Spirit that dwells within us, and we're taking him with us to the workplace. So how can we be missionaries to the workplace? What, what does it mean to be missionaries to the workplace? What does it mean to go out there and uh, do service? I, was, uh, I lived here in Toronto 15 years, and I'll tell you a little bit my story. Uh, not because it's normative, because it's my story, and I'm sure that each one of us can have their own story. I used to work in uh, IT and management consulting. It's a very cutthroat uh, field where uh, there's a lot of competition. Uh, people will just step on each other to get where they need to be, and uh, they work very hard. There's not much room for every, anything else in life. So I was in that uh, workplace when uh, I felt God calling me to go to seminary. So I went to Tyndale Seminary, did the modular program in the evenings as I was still working. And uh, fortunately, the, the way God had prepared it, it was very much a missional program. So it was not as much preparing leaders for church-based ministries. It was more preparing leaders on behalf of the church to be in the workplace, to be in the marketplace, and what does it mean for them. So some of the assignments that I had to do, I had to research my workplace. I had to understand the values that drive my workplace. And I had to understand my role. What does it mean for me to be missionary in my workplace? How can I be this transformative agent in my workplace. So I thought about it a lot, I prayed about it a lot, and uh, God showed me a few things that I could do in my workplace to be effective missionary on behalf of the church. So I'm going to mention them to you. Uh, I'm pretty sure that if you reflect on them and if you pray about it, God may show you a different list, maybe a more powerful list. The first one that I, I knew that I was called to do was the ministry of witnessing, to talk about Christ. Um, this, is, this is tough in these days, and sometimes we think we don't need to talk about Christ. We just need to live differently, and people will ask us why we live differently. Well, you know that in Toronto, people won't ask you why you live differently. Uh, it's a very multicultural city, and all of us are different. They, they don't ask the vegetarian why you're a vegetarian. They don't ask someone who doesn't drink why you don't drink. They don't ask that. Uh, I know that in our workplaces, it's not that easy to be very vocal about, about Jesus. But we can always tell, we can always say, we can always share what's important in our lives. I used to be in consulting business. I used to go with a team to a client company and be there for six months, one year. And, and we get to be very close to one another. We get to know one another. So people cannot know me and know everything about me, know where I live, know where I come from, know, know what family I have, know what color I like, and not know how important Jesus is in my life. It's, it's very easy to share about our own lives. No one will blame us for sharing about what's important in our lives. So the ministry of witnessing was something very important to me as I felt God is showing me. The second one was ministry of excellence doing everything as if to the Lord. Uh, I, I was in an environment where uh, people cut corners. If no one is watching, we save money. We save time, that means we save money. We do things that we can get away with. We don't do the best that we can. And I, I understood that God wanted me to have this ministry of excellence. 
to do the best that I can do in everything that I do. Just like Dorothy says was talking about the carpenter. The carpenter's uh, first thing to do as a good Christian, as a good follower of Christ, is to be a good carpenter, not to be a lousy carpenter. The third one was ministry of integrity. Uh, integrity is something that, uh, that we have to live by in everything that we do, including our workplace. That means doing uh, the same thing when people are watching or when people are not watching. And just have a life of integrity. Um, again, integrity in, in my life as a consultant, it was expected of us that we went, when we were asked the question to give the answer that will get more money for my company. Uh, it's not always the best answer for the client. And I, I knew that my role is to behave with integrity. I always gave the right answer for the client, the right answer that I believed was right for the client. Ministry of Holding One's Tongue. This comes from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and I loved it. Uh, holding One's Tongue. There's a lot of gossip in the workplace, and there's a lot of complaining in the workplace, and there, people complain about everything and about uh, other people. And there's always something that we're complaining about and gossiping about. So I knew that one of my ministries would be holding my tongue, not getting involved in that kind of behavior. Ministry of Service an environment where it's highly competitive, where no one helps anyone else. I had more experience than people coming into the workplace who are younger and less experienced. Uh, I knew that part of my role was to help them out, was to invest in them, help them grow in their uh, career and, and their knowledge of the environment. And that, that's definitely very countercultural in my, in my field. Minister of Counseling. I, I don't believe that I'm gifted as a counselor. That, that's not my field. But you know what? People knew that I had uh, God in my life, and uh, they viewed me as I had my act together. There is something foundational in my life that I can, it's my backing. Uh, so when, when they wanted to go out and have fun and, and go for a drink and go out on the town, they, they didn't come and talk to me. But you know what? When they had the problem in their lives, they came and talked to me. Every time there was a problem in someone's life in my workplace, the first person that they thought of was me. They would come and they would talk to me. And that, that uh, I saw that as God is giving me this ministry, this window into people's lives where uh, I can speak uh, God's love into, into their lives at their time of need. That was very important. And then the last one that I want to share with you, it was the last one that I came to understand. It's, it was the last one that I discovered which should be the most obvious one, Minister of Prayer. If I'm the only Christian in my workplace, if I don't pray for my colleagues, who's going to pray for them? If I'm the only Christian in my building where I live, if I don't pray for them, who's going to pray for them? If I'm the only Christian in my family, if I don't pray for them, who's going to pray for them? If, the, if I'm the only Christian in my school or in my class, if I don't pray for them, then who's going to pray for them? So that became very, very important for me. And uh, to put it in, eff in effect, I, I started to just look around at my colleagues while I'm working. When I see someone, I just think about them and lift them up to God right there, right then. Um, and th that, uh, that gave me a different kind of relationship with, uh, with my colleagues. And I viewed them differently. I cared for them differently because I'm praying for them. And that was, that was a big deal for me. You know what? I've, I've been back in Lebanon more than eight years and using social media, Facebook and LinkedIn. All of my colleagues from, from those counseling days, uh, consulting days, uh, they're, they're finding me out. They're looking for me. And they're checking, when you're in Toronto, can we, can we meet again? Can we? They, they know that uh, they've met someone who has something bigger in his life than just himself. That's, that's what it means to be a missionary in the workplace. It's taking God to the workplace. We're the agents of transformation. We're the agents of reconciliation. We're the agents of peace. We're the agents of the kingdom of God. We are the people that are taking the values of the kingdom to the workplace. If we don't live those values, no one else will. If we don't, if we don't advocate for uh, social practices and for justice in our work, workplace, who else is going to? 
it's easy not to care. If it doesn't affect me, it affects someone else, then it doesn't mean much to me. Well, we are the agents of the kingdom. If, if there are values for the kingdom that need to be advocated for, then it becomes our role to advocate for those. Uh, and that understanding uh, is really, has really changed my life, has really transformed my life. I, I know very well that what, uh, what I'm called to do, whatever I am, I am saved, I'm the son of God, I'm follower of Christ, with my totality, with my holistic being, everything that I am. Uh, there, there, there is no compartmentalization in uh, God's economy with just one. Uh, I love the way uh, one of the church fathers uh, put it. He was talking about uh, four levels of love. And then um, he talks about the first level of love, I love myself. That, that's the worst level of love. It's just uh, very selfish. Then the second level of love is I love God for myself. I love God for my own purposes. I love God because he loves me. I love God because he blesses me. I love God because God saved me. And then there's the third level of God. I love God for his own sake. Not for my own sake, but for his own sake. So I love myself for my own sake. I love God for my own sake. I love God for God's sake. I love God because of who he is. I love, I love God because of his qualities, his character. Uh, I love God because God is lovable. Uh, and then the fourth level of love is I love no one and nothing except for God's sake. Uh, meaning that uh, everything I do, I love my wife because God wants me to love my wife. I'm faithful at work because God wants me to be faithful at work. I can take care of my family because God wants me to take care of my family. Not compartmentalization. Uh, God is here and my work is here and my family is here and my, the rest of my life is here. Everything. I do and everything I see is within the lens of God. I love God and through God I do everything that God wants me to do. That's what it means to be, as the Father has sent me, I sent you. That's what it means to be for Jesus that he's doing the will of the Father. That's his food. That's what he, that's what he came for. And that's what it means to us to be doing the will of the Father. Taking the values of the Father, values of the kingdom into the world where we're called to be. My prayer is that uh, each one of you will be a transformative agent in this great city of Toronto. Um, it's a very difficult uh, mission field, definitely. It's much difficult where you are than sending missionaries overseas, believe me. Um, the, the environment here has been very antagonistic against Christians and against Christianity. That's why it's extremely important for each one of us to live the kingdom values where God has called us to be. Let me pray. Father, you're a God of mission, and you have mission in this world. You love this world, and you have a church in this world uh, that needs to fulfill your mission. Thank you, Father, for sending each one of us to our own circles of influence, to our own spheres, to our own places, our own context, our own neighborhood, and our own marketplace and workplace, so that we can agents of, be agents of your kingdom, so that we can take your values and show the people, be witnesses, in word and in deed for what you've done to us. Thank you, Father, for this church and for what it does here in Toronto and across the world. Uh, we praise you for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.